bless your hearts. Let's ask God to touch us today and anoint his word, will you? Pray one more time with me. I appreciated that morning devotion. It got us really in a good spirit. Let's ask God to touch our hearts with his divine truth today. Would you pray with me? Holy God, I am very sincere today in my desire to bless this people. I want somehow to stir the church of the living God. Oh, holy God, holy God, holy God, baptize us. Give us that divine anointing in favor of the Spirit. And let this audience reach out with a hunger for the word of the Lord, that somehow we could leave this place, my God, with a greater faith and determination to do more for you, for the time is very short. Teach us today. Lead us. We're starving hungry. The only way I can describe my feelings, God, is the words of David. As a dry and thirsty land where no water is, so thirsteth my soul after thee, O God. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. I'm hungry today. Would you baptize us? Would you set us aflame in this service? Hide me, but glorify your name. I sincerely pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. That name we heard about last night. Everybody said in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's love him for just a little bit. Come on, let's praise him from our hearts. Thank God and thank God and thank God. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Amen. The theme of this conference is certainly a wonderful and it seemed to have come at the right time. I want to talk today, I don't, I'm not much at giving titles to sermons. I've got a birthday coming up in a few days. If any of you want to buy me a present, buy me a book of sermon titles, maybe that'll help me out. But uh, I want to talk about something that we hear a lot about, but it seems like we don't do too much about it. And it is the direct cause for us having in our midst the Spirit of God. Not by might or by power, but by my spirit. And that's necessary, and that's needful, and that's, I don't have to have that to have, to get a sermon. The theme given to this did not make me preach this necessarily. It's that I see the need everywhere. But that spirit has to come by certain things that we do just don't automatically Brother Timmy will pardon me but I like what he said when he said these doctrinal truths does not automatically bring this and oh I wish you'd remember that I believe they are a part of it and I believe God honors it and in the dedication of the temple, Solomon reminded God that his name was there. And I believe God honored that. Folks, we need uh, today more than ever before to become conscious of what's slipping from our hands right now. And it's going. And I'm not going, I'm not going to make any amends for this statement.
Let me read in Psalms of Solomon, the second chapter, 14th verse to the 17th. O my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. For sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. My beloved is mine, and I am his, and he feedeth among the lilies. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn, my love, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains. Of course, you know the book of the Songs of Solomon is sort of a book of courtship. It has to do with the bride. There's many beautiful types of the church and also of the bridegroom. Now the bridegroom is talking to the bride, and it seemed that uh, in this book there's a difficulty. Even though the bride seems to love the bridegroom, it, it's a constant appeal from the, the bridegroom to the bride. In this particular place, it's saying, let me see thy countenance. And let me hear thy voice. For your voice is sweet to me. In the fifth chapter of the same book, comes another appeal, very similar. The bride says, I sleep, but my heart waketh. It's the voice of my beloved that knocks, saying, open to me. The answer comes from within, well, I've already washed my feet. I don't want to defile them. I've already put off my coat, and how can I put it on? But the bridegroom stands and knocks and pleads and appeals, Open to me, my love, for my hair is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. Well, I don't want to be disturbed, but he put his hand in by the hole of the door. In this particular case, he's appealing, oh, love, come and let me see you, and let me hear you. I want to hear your voice. And I believe if there's any appeal that God is making to his church today, it's the appeal for a return to prayer. I've heard Goliath used as a lot of things. And I wouldn't say that it uh, doesn't well fit. I've heard him call television. I've heard him call other uh, standards of holiness. Or should I say uh, lower standards. I've heard him call uh, a lot of things. A trinity doctrine. And oh, he's been named a little thing. And I suppose it fits. But to me today, Goliath, the Goliath of Pentecost, is nothing more or less than prayerlessness. And believe you me that I'm against television, and I'm against all this other worldliness. And, and uh, if you wanted me to name it, brother, I could name you some fine lines that I believe today. But I actually believe that our deepest need right now is for somebody to take the challenge of that roaring giant that's pleading and appealing for somebody. Come on! 
out of that camp over there, and all you trained soldiers with your armors. And uh, this is no reflection on education, but with all of your education and learning, and your great men, is there one of you that will break ranks and walk through this valley and meet me on this hill? And brother, I want you to know that army of well-trained men and well-armored men were shaking in their boots and they were trembling and there wasn't a man that shuffled and came out of their hiding. I'm not talking something that's not needed and you preachers know that I'm telling you the truth. In my travels... One of the greatest things that I find the need of, and I'll tell you it would solve a lot of problems, if the church would do as the parable in the New Testament, the woman who lost the coin, that coin has got a definite background and a history to it. That coin was given to her as a wedding gift. On that coin was an inscription of the king who had it made. But she lost it in her moving and her transferring and in, in the daily routines of life. She lost that coin. She awakens to the fact of the importance. I need that coin. That is my purchasing power. I can have no groceries out of the store. You don't go in there and load the basket down and walk by the cashier and wave hi. Lay that money right there. But you'd be surprised to know how many is trying to have a revival. Hiding behind glittering armors and swords and understanding and wisdom and knowledge and all this other stuff. And the thing that has been lost in our ranks, there's very few. I'm going to sound pessimistic and whatever you want to call me, but I want to challenge the young people today if I can. There's very few that knows what real intercessory prayer is. I told the church here a few nights ago, I said, uh, it's wonderful to have a choir and all the beautiful building you've got and everything else. But it would be better that people would know you as a group by your prayer life than to know you by your choirs and to know you by anything else or any other talents in this church. Oh, the lost coin of Pentecost. And friend, the one that gave us that coin, I want you to know he went through something to engrave his inscription and name on that thing. In Gethsemane, he toiled and, and he sweated and he cried and he groaned as he was placing an inscription on that coin that he was to give to his church. And he said, you've never asked me up to now. But says, now then you can ask me in my name. You can come to the Father by me. Now the inscription is on the coin and I've given you this coin. Now come and whatsoever you ask in my name, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. But listen to this. You receive not because you ask not. Oh, we're looking for a lot of boogers in this thing. We're looking for a lot of things that uh, we're overlooking something that's the most important. And that's our prayer life. Our prayer life to God. And I know when you talk this, you've just heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it. But, oh, God, help me today to dig you up. Listen, friend, 
That girl lit her a candle. And she started sweeping house. I want to find that coin. I need it. It's come a time when we need revivals more than ever. And we need divine healing in our midst more than ever. And we need divine revelation in our midst more than ever. But friend, it don't come without you put the coin on the counter. He said, I won't give it to you. It's just God's law. He won't give it to you till you ask. He knows what you need before you ask. But He's not going to give it to you. I'm telling you. Your city and your loved ones will go to hell without God doing one thing about it until you care. Remember this, as long as you live, God doesn't care till you care. Oh, Brother Bean, God loves the world, wants to save them. Who said He didn't? But why is there whole cities and whole countries Lying waste and not a soul there with this apostolic message. Nobody getting the Holy Ghost. No church being established. If God cares without us, why don't He go in there and start a church? And get things to go in and praying people through to the Holy Ghost. He doesn't care until we care. Your loved ones will die and go to hell. And God won't do a thing about it until you get it on your own heart. Until you sweep house and light that candle and find that purchasing power of the apostolic church. And there's nothing that will move the heart of God like intercessory prayer. Nothing. I'm afraid we're building, worshiping doctrine more than the God of our doctrine. I'm afraid we're leaving some of the greatest principles of truth out. And I see it everywhere. Somebody says, I just can't accept that conviction. I just, that sermon just don't fit. That fellow just preached too hard. Do you know what that's a product of? It's a product of prayerlessness. I'll tell you where convictions come from. They come out of the prayer room. Well, I just can't see it. I just can't understand why I couldn't trim my hair a little or these other things. You know where that comes from? Friend, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. I've noticed my own experience. When I pray more, I want less of this world. When I start wanting things like other people, you know when it is? It's between revivals and I'm tired and hadn't prayed like I should pray. And I start thinking, I'd like to have that. And I'd like to have that. And I want this. I check myself, and in every case, it's when I have not walked in prayer as I should, is when I want this. The closer you draw to Him, the less of this world you want. And I challenge you today, the things you're having trouble with accepting as a standard of holiness or anything else, I challenge you to pray till you can pray. And get a hold of God in prayer and find an intercessory prayer. And a lot of this junk won't look half as good to you. The appeal is, oh love, let me see your countenance. And above all, let me hear your voice. Oh, he's saying, church, I want to hear your prayers. I want to listen to that groaning. Oh, I'd love to see the coins placed on the table. Brother Tom Barnes, one of our great preachers, said he saw a vision one day. And uh, it looked like the heavens was just a mass of windows. And he said, uh, he was questioning the Lord about it. And the Lord said, that's my storeroom. And said, I'm just waiting for somebody to send up a prayer and open one of those windows. Just waiting. Said it's loaded and it's full, but I'm just waiting for somebody to send up a prayer. The one reason why I believe that prayer is is a, a lost coin in Pentecost, I believe we've lost the art of knowing how to pray. Therefore, prayer becomes discouraging. 
it becomes a routine. You kneel by your bed and say, thank you, Jesus, for another day. Keep me through this night, and I'll see you in the morning. And that's about it. That's not the kind of praying I'm talking about. That's not it. That doesn't bring the power of Pentecost. That coin, I'm afraid that's a token. I'm afraid that's play money. I'm afraid he wouldn't honor that. That's a counterfeit. The kind I'm talking about is a kind that moves your spirit to bring to God some strong words. Oh, I'm convinced. Listen, folks, I've prayed myself out of some tight places. I've prayed myself out of some hard spots. Just downright get out at it. Just, just labor. Toil. Walk the floor. I don't say you don't pray. The whole bunch of you pray, especially when you get in trouble. Listen to this. Listen to this. She says, this is her answer. My beloved is mine and I'm his. And he feeds among the lilies. I know where he's at. When I need him, I can get him. He's mine and I'm his. I don't have to be a praying all the time. I've won God Jesus' name and I'm his and he's mine. And I know where he's at. He's down there in the lilies. And whatever I need him. Here's what she said. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, my beloved. Uh, be thou like a roar in a young heart. Boy, when I need you now. Come on, hurry. Just really skip. Come on, my baby's sick. Or well, my wife's sick. Or I'm really in need. Boy, you can get out of the business there. But until then, I've just got so much to do, and there's so many things. So many things. So many things. So many things. I charged my mother's church one time, and uh, in the spirit, I said, Now I'm going to tell you, folks, with authority, I'm charging every one of you. To come in with a report Sunday morning. I want you to write a list of everything you do generally throughout the day. Put it down on paper. And whenever you pray, put that down in order as you pray. I don't suppose we've had anything shake that church any more than that. They came in that Sunday night. One woman got up to read her report. And she read, I got up and I fixed breakfast and I got the husband off to work and I got the children off to school and I cleaned the house and I washed and I ironed and I went shopping. She read and she read and she read and she read and she read. She must have read about 15 or 20 minutes. And she stopped and broke down and began to cry. And this that she was reading was over a period of three or four days. And I mean she was a good, clean saint. As far as holiness was concerned, she was up to par. Boy, she was just fine. But here it is, reading a period of three or four days of what she did. And she stopped and broke down and cried and said, Until this time, I had not knelt to pray. Oh, the words of Jesus, the thorns that choked, was the cares of life, the deceitfulness of riches and lust of other things. There is an experience in prayer that you can find nowhere else. There is a joy in prayer that you can find nowhere else. There are thrills in praying that you'll find nowhere in this world. I'm talking about real praying. I'm not talking about this good night, Jesus. Like the little boy that finally just said his prayer over so many times, he just wrote it out. And he just lay it on the bed. Finally, he just stuck it up the end of the bed and pointed his toe at it and said, There it is, Lord. You know what I want. That's not what I'm talking about. 
Oh, if something would settle over this audience today, if God would give me the power to stir you, we'd go home and have some revivals. And they say the days of revivals is over. And they may know what they're talking about. I'll give them credit for knowing. But I'm going to promise you I'm going to have a revival anyhow. I've found me some loopholes in this Bible. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have a revival if the whole thing shut down. There's two places in here that tells me I can still have a revival. Why did Jesus have it placed in this Bible that there was a little widow woman that went to an unjust judge? And Brother Everday, she went and said, Secretary, I'd like to see the judge. And finally went so many times to they knew her by name. Judge, here's old Sally again. Well, oh, Lord, have mercy, what in the world that woman? I just haven't got time. The next morning, Secretary, could I see the judge? Judge, would you like to speak with Sally? She's back here again this morning. Well, I haven't got time. <laughs> Say, Judge. Oh, church, let me appeal to you. As a revivalist, and if you'll allow me to call myself that, I'm stirred. I want a revival. I want a revival in California. I want a revival in every church out here. I want every evangelist to have revivals, and I believe they can. Even if the days of revivals are over, we can still have revivals. Amen. On this one basis. How come that story in the Bible about the man that goes to his neighbor by midnight and says, Neighbor, I've got some friends come in. They don't have any, I don't have anything to eat, no bread. And, and would you let get up and give me some bread so I can feed those folks, those strangers that have come in? The man said, well, I've done put the children to bed and sleeping on the, the roof of the building there on top of the door to keep thieves and robbers out. And I'll have to wake the children up and I'll have to move them off of the door. And, and it's just an inconvenient time. And, and, and friend, couldn't you come back? But, oh, he said... There's some folks come and I don't have any bread in the cupboard. And then would you please get up and give me some bread? Why is that in there? I'll tell you why it's in there. So verbal bean could have a revival. Maybe God has put his youngins to bed. I'm fixing to wake them up. All right. Oh, yeah. They, and it's hard to do sometimes. They get awful sleep and cross. And you start shaking the fire out of them and... Tell them they got to fast and pray and, and dig them up real good. <laughs> and boy, I've had them in victory march them and all that other stuff. And I've had them just almost fighting mad at me. But come on, youngins, we got to have some bread. There's some folks here starving. And we don't have any bread in the cupboard. Oh, I challenge every one of you to go home and go knocking on that door and say, God, you may have closed out for the night. You may have put all the young'uns in bed and the day of revival is over with. But there's a thousand people around us that starve in the death of the Holy Ghost. Oh, God, open that door and give me some bread. I'll tell you what he'll do. He'll give you some bread. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, he's pleading. Why don't you open the door? Come on, she said, but I'm so sleepy. Oh, I just... <laughs> and it's so much to do. And prayer is, is its not popular. It's really not. It's not the easiest thing. It's very taxing on the body. It's taxing on the mind. It's uh, Your spirit is troubled. And uh, I'm not saying this for any honor, but I've come out of travail and been sore inside for days days. It's not an easy task. But, old oh, friend, what do you want? Do you want it easy? Do you want to depend on a program and a choir and all of this? I'm telling you it won't work. I'm telling you it won't work. We've had evangelists cover the country, tried their bands, they'd go in six and sevens and call them by special tricky names and try to sing it down, but it don't come that way. It doesn't come with bands and choirs. God knows it doesn't do it. Friend, there's one thing. Go find that coin he gave you. Look good at the inscription and it bears a name. 
And He planted that name there. He engraved it with tears. He placed it there for the apostolic church. And He says, any time you bring this to the counter, I'll honor it. Yes. Whatsoever you ask in my name, I'll do it. <laughs> Amen. But don't try to come and bargain with him. Put the coin down. Amen. I made the statement a while ago, the reason I believe, personally believe, that prayer has become a lost coin. I'm talking about the kind of prayers that bring a revival. Uh, if I was to ask you how many of you folks prayed, once or twice this week, well, I guarantee you I'd get a few hands. One of our young evangelists had the boldness to go to one of our larger churches, and he asked the question, how many folks did not pray 15 minutes today? And it was astounding, the number of hands that went up. And expect the Word of God to take effect in your heart, or expecting a standard of holiness to become a part of your conviction. And you haven't even prayed. I'm afraid we're operating in the red. I believe Pentecost uh, reaped a revival as a result of the old timers that went through and hours and nights of praying and fasting. And I believe God has brought us to this point as a result of the price they paid. But I'm afraid we're just about to use our sacrifice up. I'm afraid it's about burned up. I'm afraid that the, the money is getting low in the bag. Oh, we look at our numbers and look at this. Yeah, but who, who really paid the price for that number? It might be an old man in a grave today and his bones are already beginning to deteriorate and rot away and maybe not even that much of him left. It might have been his prayers that gave you what you've got. Moses warned the children of Israel. said, you're going to go in a land where there's already houses built. There's already a city and already a wall and already brass in the mountain and already grapes are growing. I'm afraid the Pentecostal conquerors of this, this time has walked into a city already built. The grapes are already growing. But friend, you let that vineyard go and you don't protect it and guard it and you don't add to it and you don't fertilize and you don't add, friend. I'm afraid we're going to run out. The old timers' tears are just about used up. The old timers' fasting for days and days is just about gone. It's time for some of us to come out with some money. Oh, shake us here today to pray. Lord, I wish the results of this sermon, not that I preached it, but I wish it would stir us to where we couldn't do nothing tonight but pray. An all-night prayer meeting would break out. Where is that going to? Where is it? Not just for the sake of praying all night, but because that in that heart was a burden that would not be satisfied until they heard from God. Lord, I don't know how much time I've got, but let me uh, let me try to help you. I'm not the smartest fellow in the world, and I don't know all there is to know about praying, but I know a few things, and I'd like to pass them on to you. And I've found this: the majority of our people do not know how to pray. Oh, it's surprising how few of our people know how to pray. And they just don't understand. I mean, they're sincere and they want to pray. Some of them actually want to, but don't know how. <coughs> Let me give you some points that I've found that helps me in my praying and helps me to get an answer. The best example we could find is the man who's noted for his prayer. And that's Daniel. You think of Daniel. You think of somebody praying, don't you? That's how come they put him there with those lines is because he 
dared to pray in him. He was, I would consider Daniel a specialist in prayer. Notice what he said. In the first year of the reign of Ahasuerus, I, Daniel, understood by books the number, year of Darius, rather, son of Ahasuerus, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereout the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Now listen to this specialist in prayer. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled. Now listen, O my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolation. And the city which is called by thy name, for we do not present our supplication before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. He understood a secret. Nothing I could do would really move God because of any goodness of mine. It's not that. It's for thy great mercies. That's a secret you've got to understand. You can never get to the place you can command God because you're holy. You can command God because you're one God, Jesus' name. That's really not it. That's not the approach. It's His mercies. It's His mercies. Now, His five-point prayer that I teach in almost every revival. In some of these churches I won't get to go to, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it with you. The five-point prayer of Daniel has been a blessing to me, and I believe it would help you in your prayer life. O Lord, he says, hear. There's a semicolon which represents a definite pause. His first statement to God is, hear. There's a difference in hearing and hearkening. But he's getting God's attention. God, hear me. Next. O Lord, forgive. After he's got God's attention, he says, Lord, now look here in my heart. And search it out. And purge it. Forgive me. There's no use to go on and pray with sin in your life. I mean any kind of sin. Paul definitely spoke of things that would hinder our prayers. And that's what some folks have never learned. They think they can live just like they want to. It's almost Calvinistic. And do anything they want to, and any time they want to, they can go to God, and He'll come out of the valley, and like a young roe, He'll come skipping. But friend, that's not true. There's a definite approach to God, and you just well make up your mind to come that approach. God's not going to vary from it. And that's why a lot of the prayers that have been prayed have never been answered. They did not come through the right approach. O Lord, hear me and then forgive me. Another pause. Then he said, O Lord, hearken now that I've got your attention. Now that I've searched my heart. Now, Lord, hearken. I've got something to tell you. And do, do something. Then he said, defer not, don't wait, Lord, we need it right now. And he said, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mount of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation." I tell you what, the five-point prayer worked. He got Gabriel down there. Paul spoke to Timothy, and he gave him 
certain degrees of prayer. This is the approach, the general approach. But then there are degrees of prayer. He said, intercession, prayer, you notice that? And thanksgiving be made for all men everywhere. That's a secret that a lot of our people have never learned. And that's why we're not having more revivals and more healings and more results from God. Believe me, friend, that's it. You pray and pray and pray and pray and you don't get the answer. And so you give up praying. But if you could learn the first of all the approach to God and then learn the channel by which God honors your prayer today. Did you know that when you go to God in prayer today, He may not be receiving anything but prayer? And there's a difference. In the morning you may go and He's not taking nothing but supplication. Now, some of you old-timers don't look at me so strange. Uh, some, I've actually seen people have the Holy Ghost for years still didn't know how to pray. They just wallered around. If you'll pardon that southern country expression. That's all they did, just sort of waller around. I want to learn how. I don't care how long I've had the Holy Ghost. Teach me if I can get in touch with God. I want results. That's all in the world I want is results. And how do I get them? Well, I've learned this, that God has a distinct and definite approach that He'll accept. Have you ever gone in prayer and you started? I, I've been there many times. And, and I just puckered up and I was going to cry and I'm just going to beg God for something. And you know what happened? I couldn't even cry. I just had to straighten my face up and, and uh, all I could think of was thank you Jesus. Praise the Lord. Just praises would come rolling over my soul. Do you know what God was taking that day? Supplication, intercession, prayer, thanksgiving. The only thing he'll take from you boy this morning is thanksgiving. One of our missionaries said she was praying for a definite thing. And said, the Lord let a basket appear in front of her, a visible basket in a vision, empty. She said, Lord, what in the world does this mean? He said, you fill this basket with praises and I'll answer your request. Lord. We think we got to be a just, oh my God, please do it. Please, 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 please. Oh, please. Lord, 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 please. You want results, don't you? Well, let's go the method. There's times if you pray in the Spirit, like the Bible said to do, go there ready to receive from God whatever Spirit He'll place on you. There's times if you would yield to thanksgiving, you would get more prayers answered than you would praying three hours begging God for something. All right. Amen. Amen. That's true. Yes. You want results, don't you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God. I was having trouble when I was out here before. Uh, some of you folks that saw me saw I was much thinner than I am now. I couldn't eat anything. When I left the Pomona Conference, I couldn't eat a bite. I was sick and just couldn't take any food at all, a little milk. And I just asked God so many times to heal me and had preachers pray for me so much till I said, God, I've asked you my last time. This is it. I'm not asking you no more. I said, Lord, I'm just going to thank you for healing me. I get up of the morning, I couldn't eat, but I said, thank you, Jesus, for healing my stomach. 
I still couldn't eat, but I said, thank you, Jesus, for healing my stomach. That evening, I go to eat dinner, and I couldn't eat what I was supposed to, but I said, Lord, I'm so glad. I thank you for healing my stomach. That doesn't sound reasonable, but I'm telling you, I quit asking him and started thanking him for it. You know what he did? Now I'm worried about the other. <laughs> Are you listening to me today? Will you let me help you just a little bit in your praying? You see, when you come to God, you ought to come with this attitude, Lord, first of all, uh, hear me. And then if there's anything in my heart, the Bible said if you come to the altar and you think your brother has an altar against you, just, well, get up from there and go fix it. Forgive me. Now, don't, don't waste an hour down there with something in your heart. Uh, as little praying as we get out of you anyhow... Man, an hour on your knees and then waste it with something in your heart. Move it out. Forgive me. Now then, Lord, hearken, and I've got something I want you to do for me. And don't wait. Don't differ. But in your praying, if you will search after the will of the Spirit, supplication is a little more intense praying than just praying. Paul says prayer, supplication, intercession, and thanksgiving. Prayer is just praying. I mean, you don't particularly feel like jumping up and down. You don't feel like crying. You don't feel like beating no benches. You're just talking as friend to friend. I was a... Uh, I was laying flat on my back one night of praying, and I just got to thinking, Lord, you reckon, you reckon, you care about this work, position I'm in? It does seem kind of lazy, laying here on my back praying. And I wondered if He cared about position. And uh, I believe He provoked me to that thought to to give me another thought. I don't really think position means all that. At all. Uh, I know Paul said he bowed his knee, and but I don't believe it's all that important what position you're in. Physically, I mean kneeling or standing or laying down or sitting down in your mind. But God provoked a thought to me. How many times did God tell a man to get up? Stand up. You remember Daniel, the same man? Uh, when God touched him, he just uh, he couldn't even get up on he just Struggled and struggled, and God said, get up from there, Daniel. Come on. The angel said, get up. How many times have you seen that in the Bible? To Samuel, he said, Samuel, get up. Don't cry no more. Do you know, if somehow today we could understand our position with God, we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are heirs with God. And if we could ever get that in our minds, that we don't have to wallow around down there. Let's talk to him as a friend. Look what he did to Abraham. He just stepped out there. And Abraham's standing up. And God's standing up. And they're just talking to one another. God says, Abraham, I'm fixing to destroy this place over here. I thought I'd come tell you about it. Well, God, let me reason with you here a little bit. You mean you're going to destroy it if there's 50 righteous folks there? See the relationship between man and God, and did you know God enjoys that? One of the greatest defeats to our prayer life is when we come to God. I'm going to get back to these different channels of prayer, but let me inject this. One of our greatest defeats in prayer is ourselves and our attitude. We spend an hour telling God how sorry we are. And the Lord knows He knew that before you ever said a word. But here we are. I'm not worthy. Oh, God, I know I'm not worthy. Beat myself down. Oh, God, I'm unworthy. And Lord Jesus, I'd like to have this, but I know I'm not fit. Oh, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, God. I'm just so unworthy. Oh, Lord. 
Well, by the time you wasted an hour telling God how sorry you are, you've convinced yourself you're not worthy to get anything from God. You're sure enough convinced. I don't believe I'll get it. I'm just not fit to get it. Humility is a wonderful thing, but friend, that's not humility. Some of the most humble men of the Bible were the greatest prayer warriors. Look at Moses, the meekest man on earth, standing on a mountain. And God says, Moses, turn me loose that I may destroy this people. Can you imagine God telling a man to turn him loose? He said, this people you brought out of Egypt, I'm fixing to destroy the whole bunch. Moses stood there holding to God and said, Just wait a minute, God. The meekest man on earth is talking now. He said, If the first place I didn't bring them out, you did. And in the next place, if you take a one of them, take my name with them. The meekest man on earth. Daniel said, I set my face. I'm going to get an answer. I don't care what approach it takes or what channel of prayer it takes. If God won't receive prayer, then I'll go into supplication, which is a little more intense. But you see, some folks, got to, they, got, they think they've got to be a jumping up and down and hollering or crying or rolling in the floor before God will hear them. That's not so. Some of the greatest answers I've ever got from God was the driest praying I ever did. It was just talking to God, friend to friend. Now, God, I need this. There's an old prayer warrior back in our part of the country. I wish every one of you could hear him pray. I just slip in. And he's nearly blind, and he won't pray if you're there. But he's nearly blind, so I just slip in and sit down or get hide somewhere where I can hear him. Oh, I guess he's got more answers from God than the average hundred other people. And this is how he prays. I've never seen him kneel. He walks around and he said, Now, Father, I tell you what, I want you to send somebody out here tonight. And Father, I want you to... And Father, he just talking. Just talking to him. Just talking. After a while, he'll maybe say, praise the Lord, or do a little worship. But then he'll say, now, Father, I tell you, I'd sure like for you to... He just talks to him. That's praying. That's praying. Yeah, but Brother Bean, I'm not, I'm not trembling, and I'm not shaking, and I'm not crying, and I'm not shouting, and I'm not talking in tongues. You're not supposed to be. The channel which God receives you today is just talking to him, praying. That's just... Just outright praying. Now there's a time, if you'll follow the Spirit, the trouble is, we don't go, some folks don't go beyond praying. And that's wrong. Some folks have got to be a hollering and screaming, and the others, they, they've got to just be a talking, whether it don't make, make any difference. We need to learn what God's taking today. Lord, here I am. What do you want? Try to feel. Try to go deeper in prayer. But if it's not there, then talk to him. But if the Spirit comes on you of supplication, it usually brings tears. It's a little deeper. It's a, more, it's a little more intense. It takes a little more effort. Then intercession is the deepest prayer you can pray. It is the most intense praying you can do. Intercession is groaning. And it's that pressure that seems to tear you apart. And friend, there's time when God wants you to go there, and it's important. Intercession is a particular prayer for a particular thing at a particular time. And it demands something right then. I'll never forget one night an evangelist, my mother and myself, was sitting around the house after church one night talking talking about the Bible and 
Someone quoted a scripture and all of a sudden all three of us fell to our knees with groanings that could not be uttered. And we travailed and we groaned and it lifted a little bit. Then it came right back. Received a letter from a sister of mine that was in Hawaii. And uh, she was by herself. Her husband was gone and by herself in the apartment. At this very time we were praying. Or somewhere in that vicinity we were praying. God saw what was going to happen. There was one of the most noted criminals of the island came to her door, got out of prison, and came to her door. She opened the door and he acted like he was going to come in, that he turned to run. I personally believe that's when the burden lifted. But he stopped and turned around and started back. That's when the burden came back. You see, intercession, intercession is a particular prayer it's for a particular thing at a particular time. And oh, how we need to learn to yield to it. An intercessor is not his own. He must be willing to crawl out of bed any time of the night. Stop washing dishes any time of the day, an intercessor. I'll tell you what, if we had more intercessory prayer, we would have more souls saved. For the scripture is very, very true, just as true as any other part. When Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. I can testify the fact that I have never in a service in my life ever went into travail that I did not come out of that service with a soul filled with the Holy Ghost. I have never went into intercessory prayer that I did not get the results I wanted. Never, not one. I can't stand it to not pray people through. I was at a place, well, in Miami, Florida, preaching revival, and we went several nights without praying anybody through, and that liked to kill me. I just couldn't stand it. I got down between the altar and the Bible stand, I said, now God, I'm going to tell you, you either fill somebody with the Holy Ghost tonight or daylight won't catch me here in the morning. I'm not a stand where I can't pray people through to the Holy Ghost. God knew I meant what I was talking about. I would, daylight wouldn't have caught me there. I'm not a stand. I got up and looked around, and there was two men wasn't five minutes until both of them began to speak in the heavenly language. I dare you to get desperate this morning. Say, Brother Bean, I don't know why we can't have a revival. Learn the approach to God and set your face and quit condemning yourself. Repent and forget it. Do you know what we need greater than anything else almost in Pentecost? Is somebody to start preaching on the mercies of God and God's forgiveness. Do you know I've found people that are crying over sins they committed 10, 15, and 30 years ago? Never let it be under the blood. Oh, it's awful to sin. It's a horrible thing. Sin is terrible. But friend, you've got an advocate with the Father. And if you go through the right methods of repentance, forget it. One of the greatest hindrances to prayer the person's made a mistake in their life and they get down and all they can see is that mistake. Forget it. It's as though you never did it. When he forgives, my friend. Oh, listen. Do you know what Moses did to that golden calf, the sin of Israel? You know what he did to it? The Bible says he stamped it. He broke it. He stamped it. He burned it and beat it as small as dust and then threw it in the brook that descended out of the mountain. Brother, when he finished with that calf, you couldn't recognize a hoof or ear or nothing else to recognize it as a calf. When God finishes you with your sins, he crushes, he bruises, he beats, 
He burns and then he crushes it as small as dust. And when he gets through, he just throws it in that book that descended out of the mountain. And you can't find no part of it to recognize. Let God crush your sins. And then you can come boldly to the throne of grace. Yes. Then the saints can rise above. Let a fearful service come. Let somebody give out an interpretation of tongues. And about three-fourths of the church goes to the altar, scared nearly to death over the past sins they committed. When will we ever come to the place that God can say, Get up, Samuel! Rise up, Daniel! Come here, Abraham. I want to talk to you. Oh, as friend to friend. Walk up to God because He is our friend. Some folks have got it figured out that God is some old rough, hard-headed businessman and you're going in to try to get a raise from Him or something. And, and you're just scared nearly to death. And you walk in there and, and you apologize and, and you fidget around and, and the Lord... And, I'll tell you what, I sure do. I'm not worthy now. I know. And just expect him any time. Hush, I'll slap you flat of your back. Get up here. I don't want to do That's not it. He says, oh, love, let me hear your voice. Oh, yes. Yes. oh love, let me hear your voice. Yes. <laughs> oh, love, let me see your countenance. That's when you really show your countenances in that hour of prayer emptying the very bottom of your heart to God. Oh, there's nothing like it on earth. <laughs> there's nothing like it on earth. I'd rather pray than to eat when I'm hungry. There's a fellowship. There's a sweetness. I'm not saying this for honor, and God knows I'm telling the truth, but I never could understand youth. I never could. Clicking their heels together, they used to come by and say, Verbal, don't you want to go with us to the singing this afternoon? And Sunday, and no, I, ever Sunday I made it a point to stay at that church and fast and pray. I'm not saying that wrong, but I loved it. I enjoyed it. I finally, one day I thought, well, they, they kind of called me peculiar and all that stuff. And I thought, well, I'll, I must be something the matter with me. So I'll go with them. And they raced and drove up beside other cars and beat on the door and, and raced the motor and girlfriends. And whoo, I was sick. I was sick when I got back home. Never again will I leave my prayer ground for such silliness as that. That's right. Oh. Lord God, there's so much to be found. If you want to attain, brother, listen, there's a place in prayer that there's so few that'll go. The garden gate, the eight that Jesus left there, sees more in number. Then he took three on in, then he went on in himself. The closer you get to that intercessory prayer, the fewer there are in number. The closer you get to the garden gate, the more there are in number. But I'll tell you, those sitting at the garden gate, you know what Jesus told them? He said, just sit here. Those three took on a little further. You know what He said to them? Watch and pray. The reason you say, I have got no job in the church. The reason why you have got no job, the more carpenters they get in Fresno or Madeira, the, the greater chance the carpenters will be out of a job because they're overcrowded. The reason you haven't got no job, you're just a bench warmer, and we got so many of them that can sing alto and play an accordion. Friend, that's not it. That's an overcrowded position. And that's good. But Lord God, why don't you go on in where he says, Now, I'm going to give you a job. When I was in South America, we were flying from Barranquilla to Bogota. And... Uh, that morning before we left, about four o'clock, Brother Cole and myself were wakened with a heavy burden, and we began to travail, and for two hours we cried and prayed. We didn't know what it was. Maybe we thought it was something back home that was in trouble. We got on that plane about seven, took off, and that part of the time of the year is real foggy, and, that, and uh, 
We was going to land at uh, Cartagena Airport, which the runway runs right to the edge of the Caribbean. And we was coming in for a landing, and all of a sudden we looked out there, and the wheels of that plane was looked to be about three feet off the water. It was foggy, and they were undershooting the runway. It given the wrong direction. I personally believe the intercession of that morning saved that whole plane. God further emphasized to me the blessing of intercession, not only by the personal experience with him that morning, but after we finally made the flight out of Cartagena, the uh, pilot came back and said, would you folks like to look in the cockpit here and come up with us? And of course, the rest of them weren't very interested, but planes have already, always fascinated me, and I said, yeah, I really would. So I went up there and I sat between the pilot and co-pilot and I watched every move and I could see where we were going before anybody else could. And, and oh, I watched, I said, uh, we're fixing to land, you want me to get out? Oh no, everything's all right, you stay right there. I listened to him talk and I, I, I counted it an honor. I, I got to thinking about the scripture in Psalms where the psalmist said, blessed is the man whom God causeth to approach unto him. There's so many just passengers looking out the little hole and seeing what little they can see. You know, a little window there, just passengers. Just riding. No responsibility. But you know, I got called up to the cockpit and I saw where was going and I saw where all this thing was, how it was staying in the air and everything. I saw the mountains before everybody else did. What an honor when God says, come on up here in the cockpit with me. I want to show you a few things. There's somebody needs something over here, and I want you to come make intercession right here in the room with me. Not just a passenger, but God help us to rise today with a spirit of prayer. The five-point prayer and the channels by which we can approach God. Find out which one he's taking today and stay with it. Then after you've come there, set your face. It's time to quit, and I haven't started. Do you know what I've found in Pentecost? Please give me just a few more minutes because this is the most important point. Please. The word of the Lord in Hosea said, Bring with you words and return unto the Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, say to this mountain, Be thou removed. Say to this tree, Be thou plucked up. Tell it where to go. Say something. You know, I prayed around people by the dozens, and this is about all they said the whole hour they down there. Oh, God. Oh, Lord. Jesus, 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 Oh, glory, 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 Jesus, oh, Lord. Yeah, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. As important as prayer and prayer time is, and as little time in this hurried world we get to pray. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Lord, Lord, Lord. You're laughing. You must know what I'm talking about. Here's how that would be. I want something from Brother Lane. I say, uh, Brother Lane! Uh, oh, Brother Lane! Oh, what you want, Brother Bean? Uh, Brother Lane! Uh, well, Brother Bean, what could I have? Oh, Brother Lane! What can I do for it? Oh, well, oh, Brother Lane! 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 I spend an hour. Saying nothing but, oh, Brother Lane. What you want, Brother Bean? Is it uh, something? Yeah, oh, Brother Lane. You know I'm telling you the truth. 
How many times you wallowed around on an altar mansion somewhere and, and then you just said, Oh, God. Well, it's all right to use his name, but dear God, he said, Say something. Yeah. Right. I, I can imagine, God, if you'll let me use my imagination about God in human terms, I can imagine he said, Come on, son, speak up. What is it? Or maybe it's like this, Lord, save souls. Well, boy, that's, now you're talking about scatter barrel. <laughs> Lord, bless. <laughs> bless what? When? <laughs> he said, say to this mountain, this mountain, pinpoint that prayer. General prayers doesn't mean a thing to God mean a thing to God. I don't even believe he hears them. Daniel pinpointed and said, Now look a here, God. Hear me. Forgive me. Hearken. Do something. And then do it now. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what Jesus taught in his prayer. This is how he said to pray. Give us this day. Our daily bread. You know the general prayers of Pentecost. Give us some time, my Lord. Some time or another. Whenever you, uh, you. Oh, my Lord. I was holding a revival in Silsby, Texas. And I'd heard him call a man's name there. Let's pray for Brother Mr. So-and-so. That God will stir his heart. Well, Lord, God no telling how many times God answered that prayer. And he still wasn't in church. You may not believe this is important, but it is. Pinpoint it. Bring you some words. Tell God what you want. One morning I said, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of hearing Brown's name called or whatever it was. And I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. I said, now this is what we're going to pray. Now every one of you going to pray with me. God, no it was Stevens. This case was Stevens. God, send Stephens to church tonight. What we gonna pray? God, send Stephens to the altar tonight. And you know, some folks stop right there. Lord, bring on so and so to the altar. Well, he comes to the altar and leaves without the Holy Ghost. He didn't stop there. The Bible said, "Bring you some words," and I was bringing them. God fills Stephens with the Holy Ghost tonight. Not sometime in some revival somewhere tonight. And we set our face toward God and said, that's what we want. Service started that night and walks a man. Somebody says, that's Stephen. Oh, good. Never been there before. Revival. Altar call was given. Stevens came to the altar. That's fine, but that wasn't what I asked for. He got up and walked away. I went over to where he was at and laid my hand on his shoulder. I said, God, this is what... We didn't ask for this. We asked for this man to talk in tongues tonight, and he's going to do it. Stevens is a choir leader for the Silsby Church right now. He shouted all over that place and talked in tongues that night. And never been to the revival before. I dare you to get a hold of God and lay hold of Him and say, we're going to have this. Yeah. Oh, give me just a few more minutes, please. Uh, it, this is the last day. and Some of the greatest prayers, you see, that's uh, Bible times. It's kind of hard for you to receive those prayers. The one that Elijah prayed, Brother Tenney preached about, set his face and wouldn't, wouldn't stop till there came a cloud. Well, we've had some kind of praying like that in our day. One of the greatest prayer warriors I know is the sweetest, tenderest speaking woman in Texas. Old Sister Bohannon. I don't know if any of you folks ever heard of her. That woman walked so with God and so believed in the Lord. Let me tell you some experiences, and it will bless you. Her boy was, uh, and, and, and his dad got on the outs. It was such a heated argument 
until John says, I will never, as long as Daddy lives, come back in this house. It's hard to imagine a father and his son, but that happened. And uh, old uh, Brother Bohannon started to die. He was on his deathbed. And John heard about it and headed for California purposely to keep away from him. And Sister Bohannon said she knew that both of them would be lost if that wasn't out of their heart. And there Brother Bohannon was dying. She went in her bedroom and she said, Now God, you've never failed me yet. Not one time have you ever failed me. But I'm asking you to send John home before Dad Bohannon dies. And uh, she prayed and several days she prayed. Look like any minute the doctor says he's just a matter of time now and he's gone. Still no John. She went in her bedroom and sat down and said, Now, Lord, I'm going to tell you. I love you. And I intend to serve you the rest of my life. But if you do not send John home, I cannot truthfully testify anymore that you never fail me because you will have failed me. So that after a while she heard some familiar footsteps coming up the drive. John walked in, said hi mom, and went straight to the bedroom and fell across his bed. And they cried and wept on one another's shoulder and repented in just about an hour. Dad Bohannon went on cross. He said, God, I'll serve you, but I can't testify that you didn't fail me because if John don't come, you will have. I said, let me tell you another one about it. John was in the Navy. Hadn't been home for almost a year. She had a letter from him. It said, Mom, I'm somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico on my way overseas at a Oh, and I can't tell you. She said she got up a few mornings after she got that letter and she said, Now, Lord, I love my boy. And you know my heart. And I want to see John. Now, you fix it to where I can see John. And she said she went on about working in her flowers, singing and that evening late, the, the only phone in that little old community rang, and they said there's a long-distance call for uh, Mrs. Bohannon. Someone went after her and brought her to the phone, and she answered. The voice on the other end says, Mom, this is John. I said, I'm in Galveston, Texas. He says, uh, uh, could you get somebody to come after me? Said the boat uh, broke down and they had to tow us into this place and we'll be here two weeks and they gave me leave for two weeks. <laughs> that old woman said, Lord, fix it to where I can see John. And I can see angels grabbing hammers and ball bean hammers and sledge hammers. And they went out there to that ship and they started knocking around on an engine and <laughs> got that thing so out of order they had to tow it in. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. Mother Freeman, the mother of our missionary brother Freeman in Africa, had a boy when in World War I. The government sent her a report that your son Paul has been killed in action. They sent her the checks. They sent her all the papers on him. And she started receiving the monthly checks. She bundled all that bunch of checks and papers up and put them in an envelope and sent them back to Uncle Sam and said, Paul's not dead, he's alive. Said, I asked God to save him before he died and he wasn't saved and he ain't going to die until he's sa he saved. Said, I prayed through over it and he's not dead. They thought the shock of it had run the whole thing crazy. 
Five years later, they said, Mom, no, you really believe Paul's alive? Said, certainly he's alive. Ten years later, they said, Mom, you've given up now. Have, why, no, I haven't given up. Paul's alive. Fifteen years after the First World War, one evening there was a knock on the door. As the old southern custom is, Dad Freeman says, Come in. In walked a very unkempt stranger, that is, to Dad Freeman. He didn't understand. He didn't recognize him. But Mother Freeman knew who that was. She said, Oh, Paul, I knew you was coming home. Fifteen years she defied the United States government and everybody else and said, Paul's alive. Oh, if somehow we could understand who we are and what relation we have with God. Any child among you, Brother Barnes said he was sick, real sick. And he thought, now who would I want to pray for me? And Oh, he was sick. And God says, get your little girl and bring her over to the bed and tell her to pray for you. The little girl hardly, she was just good learning to talk. He called her over to the bed and says, honey, pray for daddy, he's sick. And she put her hand on his arm and said, Jesus, heal my daddy. And Brother Barnes said he came out of that bed as healed as he'll ever be in his life. The tender child moved the heart of God. Oh, church, we could have revivals. If we would say, God, it's midnight, but God, we sin, but we're holding on. I know we're unworthy, but the blood covers all of that unworthiness, and I've come after something from you. What about it? I want a revival. And by the grace of Almighty God, I'm going to have one. And I'm not talking about this one reclaimed and three blessed. If you'll pardon me, I don't mean to hurt anybody, but you read the reports in the Herald and that's about all there is to it. One reclaimed and three blessed and we advertise these evangelists as good singers. Recommend them to anybody for good singing. Lord God, Lord God, Lord God. Oh, we ought to have reports 150. Got it? And I'm sick and tired of folks saying because numbers come in that they won't last. That's right. Amen. Friend, that's not so. That's not so. You pay the price and you'll reach the most. This is our time of harvest. Amen. Lord God, they say, well, 50 prayed through, 50 will go back. <laughs> well, they don't want, they don't want a bunch. They don't want none. Give me one that's really got it. Oh, we have been so narrow-minded and so full of unbelief till we could we don't believe the book of Acts. We don't believe it. That book said one day three thousand was added to the church. Three thousand went back. Maybe they did, but the book said they were added to the church. Oh, I'm going to shock you till your teeth rattles. I believe we're going to have a return of such revivals. Well, there's countries right now, folks that's got the Holy Ghost by the hundreds, never been baptized in Jesus' name. One sweeping revival would sweep thousands in. And brother, I'm not talking about this deal that you folks have been hitting up here so hard, and I'm so glad you hit it. It's the greatest dimension of latter rain that's ever come to our ranks, this businessmen breakfast club. It is one of the most powerful and influential uh, dimensions of latter rain that's ever been known. I'm talking about, you see, one of the fellows went to there to get the Holy Ghost, and they said, just say any, many, mighty, mo." That's not what I'm talking about, friend. Lord, no, 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 no. The kind of revivals I'm talking about is where you preach all the junk off of them, 
and out of them. Well, some of the hardest preaching could be preached. I'm a preaching it. And I'm not a bragging, but I'll guarantee you I can show you two converts to the one of the compromisers. All right. And knocking the fire out of them. Won't baptize some of them. Won't told some of them to leave. Brother right. Lane understands that language. Yeah. Got up in his church one night and told some folks to leave and don't ever come back as long as you live. Don't ever darken that door again. Young evangelist called me from the East Coast, want me a revival right after that, and I told him about that. He said, Brother Bean, maybe you better wait. I haven't got to 17. <laughs> I'm talking about cleaning house as you go. I'm talking about standard of holiness as you go. I believe we can have revivals if somebody will show their countenance and let God hear their voice. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what the old girl finally woke up to. She said, by night on my bed will I seek him whom my soul loveth. She said, I'll arise now, right now, and go about the city and in the streets and in the broadways and seek him whom my soul loveth. She said, I went about the city and I found the watchman and I said unto them, Saw thou him whom my soul loveth. They said, Who is he above another? He said, You don't understand. You don't quite understand. Said, He's white and ruddy. His hair is like fine. His head's like fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves, washed with milk and fitless set. Oh, his cheeks, they're like lilies. His lips are sweet to the taste. His legs are as pillars of marble set in sockets of fine gold. You don't know who I'm looking for. Oh, she said, when I found him, I held on to him and wouldn't let him go. Oh, give us that persistence, God. She said this. She said to him, draw me and we'll run.